Human eyes are phenomenally efficient, even ones that require a little helping hand like mine. Try as we might, we have been unable to design a bionic eye that is as good in resolution or energy efficiency as the human eye. This is because cameras and our eyes don't work in the same way, despite how much we might want to draw analogies between the two. So scientists are starting to design cameras that behave like eyes and they are part of a class of science called neuromorphic computing. And these latest results are astounding. So let's discuss it. There are cameras everywhere in the modern world. Surveillance is always watching. Our phones have top end cameras in a tiny package and even our cars are starting to use cameras to navigate. Everywhere you look is a camera that is taking in information from the world and storing it. But as much as cameras have improved phenomenally over the years, they are still poor in comparison with our eyes. And this is because our eyes have something special that cameras don't have, the power to ignore. We can build a camera that has similar or greater resolution than our eyes. We only have so many rods and cones, and even though the pixels in cameras are often quite large, with the right lenses, we can get a better resolution. We do make cameras that have better night vision, can image thermal radiation, and we can even make them have better color vision than us. But all of these tasks have one problem, data. Computation is responsible for almost 10% of global energy consumption at the moment. And uh, with increasing um, interactions in social media, the exchange of images, this computational um, burden on the planet is only going to increase. This requires new techniques to acquire and process data. What better than trying to emulate the highly efficient processing of the human brain. So what we are trying to do here is implement neuron-like architecture to process information rapidly, very efficiently and enable real-time decisions. These researchers are building something called a neuromorphic device. The term neuromorphic is just a compound of neuro, meaning related to neurons or nerves, and morphic, meaning having the form of. So it means to have the form of neurons. Not as mysterious as it first sounds, but it is pretty amazing feat if it is achieved. The goal of neuromorphic engineering is to reverse engineer the brain by mimicking the structure and the function of neuronal networks. In this case, it is the building of a camera that uses artificial neurons. We are trying to make low power devices as well as emulate the basic synaptic functionalities of the brain. We do all the experiments under like a minimal bias of 50 millivolts. So the brain operates when these uh, communication, like communication between neurons occur in the brain, the synapses fire, the voltage that's used in there is negative 70 millivolts. So we've used 50 millivolts to replicate a similar functionality with our device. Our optical nerve can transfer around 20 megabits per second, whereas cameras require orders of magnitude more information than this. So how can our eyes see so well with so little information? The key is that we use neurons and dynamically adjust the focus to minimize the need to transfer as much data. We see the person we're talking to, but we ignore the background around them and our brain just fills in the missing information. Researchers have demonstrated that when parts of our vision are blocked, our brain just fills in the blanks. In the same way that artificial intelligence can extend or modify images, our brain already does this. And not only can it do it, it's doing it all of the time. But unlike current AI, our brain requires a minute amount of energy to perform these calculations. We are truly an amazingly efficient computer. So the problem is cameras are inefficient and data hungry. The solution is to make cameras that work like our eyes. How do you make a neuromorphic camera? So th there are two aspects to it. Uh, obviously, when we're talking about capturing visual information, similar to how human vision does, we need elements that can detect a broad uh, wavelength of light all the way from visible. Uh, and preferably even into IR, which the human eye cannot do. However, that's only part of the solution. The next phase is to actually gather all that information and process it rapidly. And for that, 
current technologies utilize a combination of different auxiliary components. So you have a separate uh, light capture unit, then a storage unit, and then a processing unit. And all of that makes it really hard to actually integrate the entire process onto a single platform, uh, making it really energy inefficient, if you could call it that way. So here, what we are trying to uh, achieve is having light capture elements that can also store and process information within the light capturing elements themselves without the need of these auxiliary components. So each pixel of this light capturing material can be imagined as a neuron that not just you know, captures light, but also processes on-chip information and enables that real-time decision-making capability. The idea behind the project is to replicate the function of our eyes and the brain to make a fundamentally new type of camera. But the idea of replicating our eyes isn't new. We've been trying to make a replacement for our eyes for quite some time. The images of cybernetic implants to enhance our vision is strewn throughout sci-fi. And it is not that surprising. With all of this new technology that we have developed, why can we not replace or at least modify our eyes to be better? Well, evolution is an efficient beast that has developed a rather remarkable system that is not that easy to replicate. Despite the difficulties, the quest to make a bionic eye is accelerating, with some devices gearing up for human trials. However, the goal of bionic eyes is to ultimately give vision back to people who have lost it. It's not to improve our eyes or to replace cameras. This research is different. It is trying to develop the next generation of cameras, ones that mimic the human eye, take advantage of artificial neurons, and uses machine learning to learn. This is called a neuromorphic camera, but it is not easy to realize. I think the biggest roadblock is having the light capture, processing and decision-making ability all in the same chip. At the moment, each of those functions are performed by separate components, and that results in significant, as I said, energy inefficiencies and also delays, which cascade. So the more information you have, those delays become longer and longer. And a classic example of this is if you were to mount a traditional CMOS sensor on a satellite to monitor, say, large parts of the ocean or, or the sky for any new objects that are appearing. So at the moment, how this is done is uh, essentially frame by frame collection of images. Uh, most of them are redundant. And then these are sent down very expensive optical downlinks uh, to Earth. Then there is an operator with a computer uh, running machine learning algorithms. And by the time, for example, a submarine or some object of interest has appeared, to the time that you really know about it, it has been many days. So it really removes that real-time intervention capability completely. What a neuromorphic processor can do is you could have that same chip mounted on the uh, CubeSat, which is acquiring information, looking for changes, and only sending data down through those expensive optical downlinks when there is something of interest. So it significantly cuts down not just the amount of information that's being gathered, but also the rapid processing because that happens on the chip itself and not through auxiliary components. To overcome some of these roadblocks, they turned to two-dimensional materials. As the name suggests, these materials are flat materials that are one or a few atoms thick. Most people are familiar with graphene, which is a single atomic layer of carbon atoms, which is a particularly amazing electronic properties. But there are actually many different types of two-dimensional materials, and there are many that are quite interesting. The physics of electrons fundamentally changes when they are confined to a two-dimensional plane. And this allows two-dimensional materials to be better than three-dimensional materials for many different tasks. It turns out that two-dimensional materials might be the key to building these neuromorphic computers. So what's special about two-dimensional materials that uh, makes them useful for this task? So the key obviously is three-pronged here. So as I said, the need for capturing light, but also storing, so memory and processing. Uh, now, not all materials can enable that. Two-dimensional materials uh, have unique properties uh, because of quantum confinement effects. So if you have the same material in its bulk form, 
uh, compared to that same material in an atomically thin form and I'm talking about uh, layers that are single atom or two atoms thin, uh, their electrical and optical properties are significantly different. So what these two dimensional materials can enable is they can capture light across broad wavelengths. So you can engineer these material systems to capture, you know, UV visible or infrared wavelengths of light, but also utilize defects in these materials to store and process this information, which is otherwise not possible. And that's sort of the three key features embedded within the 2D materials that we utilize to capture the information, but then store and process it uh, as well. And that's the feature that enables emulating functionality of neurons. Two-dimensional materials are also useful in terms of their form factor and how they can be manipulated to conform to the shape that we desire. So one of the key things with 2D material is like its atomic thinness and it has like high uh, flexibility, like it can withstand a lot of stress. So it kind of like makes the thing very compact and lightweight and you can put it on easily integrated on transparent substrates or flexible devices. It also turns out that 2D materials happen to behave in a similar fashion to our neurons. In biology, when synapses fire, there's a current generation and then that current decays very slowly. So this trend is very similar to the persistent photoconductivity that you observe in uh, 2D materials. Cameras are mostly useful because they're portable. Except for some very special cases like the James Webb telescope, we want cameras to be small. In neuromorphic cameras, this means that both the pixels and the neurons need to be small, very small. Two-dimensional materials help with this task, but they also have their own problems. The pure form of this 2D material is not useful in this neuromorphic device. To transform it into a useful material, defects need to be systematically introduced into the material. This is generally referred to as doping and involves replacing some of the atoms with different atomic species. Doing this systematically without degrading the material can be quite difficult, but they managed to find a neat solution where they interacted the two-dimensional material with liquid metals by bringing them into contact with each other. Not only does this technique produce the right doping of the material, it's also scalable, meaning that they can produce large sheets of the material. This might not seem like a big deal, but it's actually really hard to make large sheets of two-dimensional materials and to make something that has a practical benefit, we need large sheets. Doping other materials into uh, two-dimensional materials is really hard. So we've achieved a doping technique which has made the sheet really large area that has allowed us to engineer like four cross four pixel array. And based on the lateral dimension of the sheets, you can actually go further. Like you can make, currently the pixels are 20 cross 20 microns active area. You can narrow it down to two cross two like industry standards because it's a uh, photoconductance is super good. It is one thing to make a material that has a photocurrent that is basically just a solar panel. It's another to make one that has a memory. And this is what can really separate this camera from normal ones. Just like how we can remember all of the most embarrassing things that we have ever done while trying to fall asleep at night. This camera can remember something that has been seen for a long time using a neuron style memory. Importantly, it is not sending this information to a memory device. The photo detecting two dimensional material also acts as the memory storage. This two in one approach drastically reduces the complexity of the device. We shine letter patterns onto it using UV source. So whichever pixel array is like in line with the illumination area, it generates photo current and wherever it, the light is blocked, it is completely blocked out. So that's how we do pattern generation. So it helps us in like, it can be used for image recognition in future. So the key element that we chose here for like, uh, that actually piqued our interest for choosing this material was that it has an extremely long retention. So if you don't have a very long decay and then your computational side won't be able to like 
read that data. It's gone before you actually can read it and like feed it into the neural network to identify what it was. So, so you need to be sensitive to low amounts of light yeah. that uh, is fast, so the yes. image might not be there for very long. Yeah. And then you need to retain that information for a long period of yes. time so you can identify what it was. Yes. This is preliminary research. The technology is not the stage where we can take it outside and start using it to identify objects in the park. Instead, it needs to be calibrated in a confined and systematically reproducible manner. This involves the use of lasers in the ultraviolet spectrum and defined shapes to image. These cameras aren't going to be in your phone anytime soon. At the moment, they're being designed for specific tasks in remote imaging recognition. This means that they will be useful for capturing images in places where transferring data is either difficult or expensive. But it doesn't mean that it will stop at these tasks. Maybe we will start to see neuromorphic technology integrated into our lives soon. There is so much amazing research going on in the world, and it is exciting to see it up and close in person. I recently visited a group that is performing the einstein podolsky rosen paradox on clouds of atoms, which you can check out here.